Hi everyone and welcome back to Advanced Fire Biology Unit 1, Key Area 1 and Part C, Separation Techniques. So we are still on the laboratory techniques for biologists uh, key area and this time we're going to be looking at how and why we separate various solutions and mixtures in the laboratory. So we're going to start off with using a centrifuge, something you may have came across before. The centrifuge is basically a machine that you load samples into and it's going to spin those samples at extremely high speeds in order to separate that material according to density. So it's something you may have seen before in terms of centrifuging uh, blood samples, for example. If you spin that around through a centrifuge, then the different components of blood are going to separate out and you can sample the platelets, the white blood cells, the plasma, for example. So what's going to happen here is through centrifugation, the high density materials are going to sink to the bottom. They're going to form a pellet down the bottom of your tube. But the low density materials, they are going to float and they're going to move up to the top and form what we call a supernatant. So again, you have separated out uh, the solution into different densities and you can sample whatever it is you're trying to find from them. The next one is something you have probably came across at some stage in school, uh, probably starting off by using uh, pens and separating out ink, for example. So chromatography. So chromatography is used to separate different substances such as amino acids and sugars. Now, the way this works is the speed that each solute moves through your chromatography uh, paper or thin layer, uh, that all depends on the differing solubility of the solute in whatever solvent you're using. So the image that you have in front of you is from different pigments from leaves that you might have used before. Those different pigments are going to have differing solubilities in the solvent, and that means that each solute is going to be able to have a distinct place, it's moved across at a different rate, and you can see uh, the differences from that one sample you've added. Now, as I said, there are different forms here. Uh, the ones that you've probably came across are paper chromatography, really simple. You just use chromatography paper. You add a sample of whatever it is you're looking to uh, use, and you will see the different movement of those different solvents throughout that paper. For example, the leaf pigments on the right. The other form though is thin layer chromatography. So it's the exact same process, but it's just slightly different materials being used. It's a thin layer of either silica gel or alumina or cellulose, and that's going to go over a glass slide. And again, same process, uh, you're going to separate out that sample. They're going to move at different rates based on their differing solubility, but it's going to run faster and it will give clear separations, which can be quite useful as well. One question you may come across in more in terms of problem solving is calculating RF values. Now, what we do here is this is looking at the distances traveled of these different solutes. So for example, the diagram on the right, uh, again, is showing you these different pigments in a leaf. So you have your carotene up the top that has moved the fullest distance, and then you have your chlorophyll B that's not traveled uh, relatively as much. To calculate an RF value, uh, you use this different uh, this equation here, sorry, where you look at the distance from the origin, and the origin is where you added the sample to the top of the pigment. So you would measure from where you added the sample to, for example, if you're looking at carotene, from here up to here, where the carotene has actually traveled. Once you have that measurement, you have that number, you're then going to divide that number from the total distance from the origin, so the, the sample point, to the top of the solvent. And it's not very clear in this diagram, but the solvent moved up here. So you divide those numbers, and then you would find your RF value, which is the movement of that sample or pigment relative to the overall distance moved from the solvent itself. So you'd see here that carotene that's moved further has got a higher RF value than, for example, the chlorophylls that have not moved that much. Another form of chromatography which is more complex but again is just looking at separating out uh, different materials is affinity chromatography. Now this form of chromatography is used in order to separate out proteins. So we'd have a mixture with target proteins that we want to extract and we can use affinity chromatography in order to actually uh, trap and extract these proteins. So how this works is we would have a solid matrix 
or a gel column with specific molecules in the side of it. So these would usually be receptors for the proteins that we want. So these molecules, receptors, are going to be inside this column. And what we're going to do is pour a solution containing a protein that we want through this column. So the diagram on the right will help sort of visualize this. The blue parts are the specific molecules or so receptors and the different colored materials that are going through are different proteins, but only the red ones are the ones that we want. So what's going to happen is these, uh, this mixture of proteins are going to get passed through this column, so they're going to travel down it, but the target proteins we have, these soluble target proteins, they're going to have a high affinity for the receptor molecules that we have inside this column. And if you remember, High affinity means that protein is going to go across and bind to these receptors. So they should bind, but the non-target molecules, the other molecules that we don't, we don't want, we don't care about, they're going to have a weak affinity, so they are not going to bind to the receptors. They are just going to pass through that column and are going to wash out. Once we have done that then, the target proteins that we've been looking for, we can then remove them from those receptors, retrieve them and use them for whatever it is we are wanting to want wanting to use them for, but it means that those proteins have now been separated and extracted from the mixture. And again, this diagram just shows uh, in the same amount of detail, just to try and get it into your head, you have your solid column or gel matrix um, where you have your specific molecules. This mixture of different proteins are going to be passed through the column, but only the target proteins are going to have a high affinity for our uh, receptor molecules inside the column or inside the matrix. And those non-target molecules with a weaker affinity, they're just going to pass through and wash out and we are left with the target molecules, so the target proteins that we wanted in the first place. The next form of separation we're going to look at is electrophoresis. Now, gel electrophoresis is something you may have had experience of or you may have, may have seen it in any, uh, say, TV show or clip that involves uh, DNA or forensics, that side of things. Now, what this is, is this is a method of separating out proteins and nucleic acids. So what we would have is a gel, such as in these diagrams, with different wells up the top of this gel. And in those wells, you're going to add samples of, for example, DNA. What's then going to happen is an electric field is going to be applied to that gel matrix and in that process these charged macromolecules are going to move through that field. Now the main thing here is that these charged molecules are going to move towards the opposing charge. They're going to migrate through this gel and we're going to be able to have these different uh, nucleic acids being separated out throughout this gel once we've ran the charge through it. Now, the, the main part here is that if you have small molecules, they're going to travel faster uh, and travel therefore further than the larger molecules, which aren't going to move overly far away from uh, where we've actually added these samples into the wells in the first place. So you're going to get this banding that you'll see in any sort of forensics picture of these different sizes of molecules. Now, the main thing there, though, is that there's two different forms of gels that you can use. So we have one called native gel, and native gel is going to separate out those molecules by both their shape, their size, and the charge as well of those molecules. So quite a few different things. But we can also use SDS page, and all that's going to do is separate those molecules by their size. So by the smaller molecules moving further, the larger molecules not moving as far. Now you can see the differences in these by the, the picture at the bottom of the slide here. You have SDS page on the left and native on the right. They're the same proteins, but because they've been separated through the different types of gel, you can see the different results we have. So for uh, picture B, the native gels, they do not denature the molecules that we are sampling. So that means that shape, size, and charge is being used to separate out those proteins. However, in SDS page, all the molecules are given an equally negative charge. So the molecules all become denatured, and that means that these proteins are only being separated by their size. And you can see the comparison in picture A on the left there about the size being uh, separated out in these proteins. And the final part we're going to look at is IEP or isoelectric points. 
And what this is, is if we use an IEP, that is the pH where a soluble protein has no net charge. And if a soluble protein has no net charge, then we can use that to precipitate out of a solution. It's not going to move any further. So if you go and buffer a solution to a specific pH, that protein that has an IEP, an isoelectric point, of that pH will precipitate out. So we can use this alongside the process of gel electrophoresis in order to separate out different proteins. So for example here, there's a picture at the bottom showing you more what this would look like in a exam format, but we have uh, four different molecules here that have all been added into a gel and the gel has been ran. However, what you can see is the proteins will move towards charges unless they reach an area with a pH of their isoelectric point. And at that point, they will not move because they have no net charge. So for example, in this question below, you can see that despite a, a um, electric current being run through this gel, number two has not moved. It was applied to the midline and it has stayed at the midline. Therefore, it has no net charge, it has not moved, and it is at its isoelectric point. So that has been separation techniques. Hopefully you found that useful. Have a look at the different types of separation techniques, what you separate out from them, and how and why you would use them. That's all for part C, and I'll see you again for part D, which is using antibodies to detect proteins. Bye for now.